not gonna lie, just had some chocolate. It is my birthday after all. Welcome to Food for Thought, the place to explore, celebrate, and manifest a life motivated and defined by unconditional compassion and optimal wellness. My name is Colleen Patrick Goudreau. I am your host. You can find me at ColleenPatrickGoudreau.com or Joyful Vegan. Dot com and on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and wherever I exist on the interwebs. You can subscribe to Food for Thought at iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you're enjoying this free podcast called Food for Thought, thank you for sharing it with others and leaving ratings and reviews. Word of mouth is the best way to increase its listenership, and I'm grateful to all of you who have left reviews. And of course, supporting it is the best way to keep it going. You can go to patreon.com slash Colleen Patrick Goudreau to leave a tip in the jar. Very importantly, the Compassion in Action Conference is now officially live, so go to compassioninactionconference.com and join me in August in Oakland for a life-changing, life-enhancing event where you will connect with dozens of like-minded men and women and learn to be the best, the most effective, the most joyful ambassador of compassion you know. And because today is my birthday, you can still take advantage of the special I have where you register yourself and then you register a friend for half off. I'm going to leave that open to give you a little time to take advantage of that birthday offer. And many of you already have. I'm extending that time. So that is my birthday gift to you. And finally, I want to share some news with you. I have a publisher for my new book. I'm about to sign the contract. I have accepted their offer and I'm very excited to share it with you. It is all about the social and emotional and practical aspects of being and staying vegan, whereas the 30-Day Vegan Challenge is all about becoming vegan and transitioning to being vegan. This new book is all about staying vegan and handling all of the social aspects that I've been hearing about uh, for so many years and guiding people through. The working title, there are two working titles. Love to hear your thoughts. It, the first one is In Defense of Compassion, The Joyful Vegan's Guide to Life in a World that Wants You to Keep Eating Meat, Dairy, and Eggs. And then the second one, which is kind of my preference at this point, is The Joyful Vegan, The Definitive Guide to Living Compassionately in a non-vegan world. That is what we're dealing with, but that's the idea. And that includes the 10 stages of what happens when you stop eating meat, dairy, and eggs that many of you have heard about on this podcast. I'm going to be expanding on that and, and talking about, like I said, being vegan and staying vegan. I'm very excited to share more with you as I start writing it, but I wanted to at least share that with you. It really is the best gift I could have hoped for um, on my birthday. So I'm passing it on to you. Today's topic is zero waste, the beginning of a new journey. Hi, everyone. I hope you are doing fabulously well. I have something to tell you, so brace yourself. I'm no longer vegan only. I am now zero waste vegan, if one can characterize themselves that way or define themselves that way. But it is true, I have embarked on this journey that I am so excited to share with you. I've been sharing it on my website, Joyful Vegan, in social media, and there's so much to talk about, so much related to how this affects animals and how this affects our earth and uh, the impact that we have. As I always say, it's not that we uh, can make a difference in the world, it's that we do make a difference. The only choice we have is to decide whether the difference we inevitably make is negative or positive. And of course, there's lots to talk about. Uh, And so I started this journey and I started by writing about this on my blog and saying that I've been vegan for almost 20 years and my husband a little less than that. And as you know, I'm vegan because I don't want to contribute to violence and harm against animals. And we do our best to live lightly on this earth. We compost our food waste in our own compost bins, as well as in the city's green bin. We compost all of our yard trimmings. We gray watered our plumbing several years ago. And so we irrigate one of the gardens with our used bathroom shower and sink water. We have tanks that hold up to a thousand gallons of rainwater to irrigate another part of the yard in the back. I work from home, thus I don't commute. And my husband walks to the casual carpool to get to work in uh, San Francisco, uh, and he walks home from the bus stop on the way back, meaning we don't drive during the week. The casual carpool, by the way, is something that started in the 1970s in the San Francisco Bay Area, and it's 
the most wonderful grassroots experiment that has been working brilliantly for over 40 years. Basically, cars pull up and you get into a stranger's car. So you can reduce the number of cars going across the bridge from the East Bay to San Francisco. And you get into the city cheaper and faster because you can get into the carpool lanes once you have three people in your car. David has been doing this for almost 15 years. When we do drive... It's a 14-year-old Prius that still gets 40 miles to the gallon. We shop for produce at our local farmer's market each week, often walking there instead of driving. In fact, I walk everywhere to the local stores for groceries. It's one of the reasons we wanted to move to this neighborhood, to my bank, to my post office, to restaurants, even to hiking trails. I stopped buying canned beans a couple years ago to reduce unnecessary packaging, and so I make my own legumes and lentils and, of course, grains from scratch. We use canvas bags for all our groceries. We tell restaurants not to give us straws. We wash and reuse the few plastic bags that have wound up in our house. And yet, I realized recently that I unconsciously stopped doing more than that because I thought I was doing a lot. But having had a recent epiphany, I know now how much more I can do, which I'm now implementing in my life and in my husband's life in in our home. And David has been such a champion because he's on board with me, even though, of course, I'm driving all of this. And it has been life altering. I announced to David at the start of this year that one of my intentions for 2018 was to live as close to zero waste slash plastic free. They really go hand in hand, uh, at least single use plastic free. Uh, They go hand in hand. And I wanted to live as close to zero waste plastic free as possible. And the journey has thus far been enlightening and exciting and overwhelming. I feel like what new vegans feel like, a feeling I haven't had in almost 20 years, but I remember. And now that I'm looking through a new lens, I'm noticing things I never noticed before, just like what happens when you start looking at the world through a vegan lens and you start noticing things you never noticed before. And for me, one of the most significant experiences I'm having is that I see single-use plastic everywhere I look, including in my house, that I consider to be pretty good on the waste front. And I was wrong. I was so wrong. And I'm so glad I realized it when I did. Someone asked me recently, what made me embark upon the zero waste quest? And my answer is that it's for the animals, just like everything else I do. It's because I feel that as a human animal, I intrude upon other animals' lives and I impose myself and my desires and my being upon them in so many ways. And I can't help that in some ways. And yet I want to do everything I can to live in this world, having as little negative impact as possible. As I said, those are the only two choices we get, whether we have a negative or positive impact, there are no neutral actions. And just as with being vegan, it's not about being perfect. It's about doing the best we can. And there is so much we can do. I honestly fancied myself as someone who lived pretty lightly on this earth, but I've been so excited by all that I'm learning and I can't wait to share it with you. And I'm also encouraged by so many people who have been doing this for much longer than I have and who inspire me and inspire so many people around the world, including Catherine Kellogg, whose 30 Day Zero Waste Challenge was really the thing that pushed me into high gear to get me started. And Catherine is one of the featured presenters at this year's Compassion in Action Conference. So be sure, as I said, to register for what will be a just incredible event. This is the third annual Compassion in Action Conference. And I think it's like no other conference in terms of what you go come away with, the friendships you form, the, the things you learn, and I'm really proud of that. So I also encourage you to follow Catherine at goingzerowaste.com and on social media. She's absolutely lovely. She's incredibly inspiring. She's joyful. And we are filling up uh, for the Compassion in Action Conference. So take advantage of that 50% off special by registering yourself and then bringing a friend for 50% off. I'll tell you a secret. You can register a friend for 50% off now and tell me the friend's name in a couple weeks, but just register so we get you uh, in there and you don't miss out. We're also going to be making this somewhat destinational, is that a word? So that it's also going to be about the experiences in addition to the conference. So the conference is at Lake Merritt Boathouse, the sailboat house. 
which means we're right on Lake Merritt. We're right on the lake. And at lunchtime on both Saturday and Sunday, you will have the option to take boats out on the lake. So you can take paddle boats out. You can take a kayak out. You can take a sailboat out if you're, if you are certified to sail. And we are going to ask you for that um, in advance if you're interested in that so we can get you a reservation and you can take your lunch time at, and get on the lake. It's going to be a beautiful, beautiful weekend, I know. So what I'd like to tell you uh, first is about the concept of zero waste, what it means, how it got started, and what the what the principles are so that you might be inspired to kind of look at things differently and possibly implement some of these principles in your own life. I've been moved by how quickly I'm finding the people around me, my friends and my followers and my husband making changes just based on the small steps I've already taken. Of course, being zero waste and plastic free goes hand in hand with my being vegan. It's a means to an end. It's the means to my goal of not causing harm to other animals as much as I can avoid it. And there are so many ways in which we animals um, harm the lives and the well-being and the health and the habitats of other animals. So I'll be sharing lots of info on today's episode, but zero waste is now fully incorporated into my vegan life. And so I look forward to sharing a lot more with you on the Food for Thought podcast as time goes on. So this is the very beginning of what you're going to hear. You'll hear other things. I still have lots to say about advocacy and communication and getting involved politically and food and wellness, et cetera. But this is a big part of what I think is kind of the next frontier, at least for me. And uh, and hopefully you'll be able to take away some of the principles. And one of the First things I discovered about the zero waste concept tickled me to bits, and I'm going to tell you about it. But before I do, I want to make sure that all of you understand how grateful I am to you for listening to this podcast, for supporting this podcast, for supporting my blog, for supporting my work in general, enabling me to share the tools and resources people need to cause as little harm as possible. I want to thank all of you listening right now, all of you who subscribe, and all of the supporters. And thank you, of course, to our Platinum support. Tim Anderson, Renee Marinkovich, David Cabrera, Alexander Gray, Morgan Hall, Mikhail Stone, and Ulrich. Thank you to all of the Super Gold supporters, Sarah Bone, Michael McNeely, Nina Bircher, Ranjini Mohan, Jennifer Watkins, Sherry Lupitan, Kenda English, PJ Schuster, and Tina Strassheim. I'm so grateful to all of you for your support and to everybody at every level. So please go to patreon.com slash Colleen Patrick Goudreau and help continue make this information available to others. The first time I heard the term zero waste was several years ago when my city of Oakland had just adopted what is called in municipalities a zero waste policy in relation to their waste management. In December of 2006, the Oakland City Council passed a resolution adopting a zero-waste strategic plan to reach their zero-waste goal by 2020. Oakland's zero-waste goal was to cut the city's current waste disposal, at the time the current waste disposal, was 400,000 tons of waste per year to 40,000 tons per year, which is a 90% reduction, going far beyond what any U.S. city has achieved to date and making Oakland the leader of large cities In waste reduction, though there's a lot more to say about that, I was excited by the goal. I remember when I first heard about it, and I remember where I was, and I remember when it passed, and I was really encouraged by it. And I noticed the change in our waste management options kind of right away, mostly in terms of the city's compost program. And I went about my life thinking I was doing pretty well to help my city reach that goal. But it would be 10 years, more than 10 years, before I made the significant changes I'm making now to really have an impact. So what you're going to learn is that zero-waste strategies are about governments, they're about manufacturers, and individuals doing their part. So it's a huge concept that has many players and many parts for it to work and be implemented. And you know where the concept was born? You know where the term zero-waste was first used? It's Oakland, 
California, baby. I had no idea. But as I started doing the research for this episode, that's what I discovered. It was a total surprise to me. And it's one more reason I love my city so much. The zero waste term, zero waste, was first used publicly in the name of a company, Zero Waste Systems, founded by a chemist named Paul Palmer in the mid-1970s in Oakland, California. The mission of Zero Waste Systems was to find new homes for the surplus chemicals created by what was at the time the nascent electronics industry. Paul Palmer noticed that the newly emerging Silicon Valley was using a lot of different chemicals that they were discarding, even though they were pretty pure, these chemicals. So he formed a company, Zero Waste Systems, to market this perfectly clean, quote unquote, waste product as lacquer thinner. As the company prospered, they grew to 20 employees and to two locations, and they learned to make use of every chemical that Silicon Valley discarded. Now, sadly, they've closed since then, and now thousands of drums all over the country and all over the world are filled with chemicals that are buried at the bottom of chemical dumps. But that's how the concept of zero waste started. The heir to the Zero Waste Systems mantle is the Zero Waste Institute, also founded by Paul Palmer which can be found at zerowasteinstitute.org. Now, of course, the term zero waste has taken on other meanings that I think Paul Palmer would say misses the point of what zero waste should be about. Here's what he would say. The term zero waste has been borrowed. Here's what he did say. The term zero waste has been borrowed by all manner of others to denote many low-level, ineffective, wasteful processes, often referred to as zero waste to landfill. The reader should not confuse these derivative notions of zero waste management with the high aspirations of zero waste theory. So, The zero waste theory that he's talking about has more to do with redesigning products in industry and commerce so that discard never takes place in the first place and so that no waste needs to be reused or recycled. I think that even though he would support people like me who are trying to reduce the waste we're responsible for, that I am responsible for, that I buy, I have a feeling he would say that it's just rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. The problem is that products are designed for discard rather than being designed for reuse. And if we don't tackle that fundamental issue as a society, we'll never tackle the waste issue that is detrimental to our planet, to the environment uh, presently and to the future of this earth. So for instance, building on the lessons learned from Zero Waste Systems, the Zero Waste Institute considers recycling to be no more than an appendage to garbage creation and to the garbage industry. The Zero Waste philosophy looks beyond recycling strategies to policies that minimize resource consumption from the beginning by encouraging closed loop product and production designs that stress re use. In short, zero waste is an approach to the complete life cycle of any created good, which seeks to reuse them over and over for essentially the purpose for which they were created. Ideally, such goods should be used forever to satisfy the designation of zero, right? Zero waste. So the idea is that these goods should be able to be used forever. But in practice, a shorter time is substituted, they would say at the Zero Waste Institute. And that shorter time is a common lifetime, which is considered about 100 years. Now, I'm not a designer or a manufacturer of products, but I am a consumer of them. And I know you are too. So let me ask you a question. Is this the criterion you use when you purchase an item that it can be used for the purpose for which it was made for 100 years or more? Because I'll be honest, that hasn't been my criterion for purchases, even though I would have labeled myself a conscious consumer. If I even considered myself a consumeristic person at all. So this really changed the way... I'm looking at things. I'm talking about a real paradigm shift here. So what I'm getting at in this first episode on this topic is that zero waste is more than about my making YouTube videos to teach the world how to make zero waste almond milk, though I'm still going to share that with you. 
It's a whole systems approach that aims for a massive change in the way materials flow through society, resulting in no waste at all. And if you think that's lofty, you know, we've sent um, people to the moon. So I, I don't think it's lofty. I think it's just so different than how we've ever looked at waste, at least for me. There are probably some very smart people out there who have been looking at it very differently all this time. But for me, it's a real game changer. And this is why I think Palmer would be critical, even of a city like Oakland and many other cities, that pat themselves on the back trying to achieve their zero waste goals. I mentioned earlier what they're doing is just operating in the field of waste management. And that's not what zero waste is about at its core. Does that make sense? Zero waste goes beyond waste diversion. Zero waste planning demands that components be redesigned for effective reuse over long lives, striving to ensure that products are designed to be repaired, refurbished, remanufactured, and generally reused, creating a circular economy rather than a linear economy of make, use, dispose, which is what we're in right now. Zero waste is a goal. It's a process. It's a way of thinking that profoundly changes our approach to resources and production. Certainly, it's changed me profoundly. And it's not about recycling. It's not about diversion from dumps, but about restructuring production and distribution systems to prevent waste from being manufactured in the first place. Zero waste means that product designers, manufacturers, retailers, municipalities, and consumers all share responsibility. And that's where we can do our part. We all have a part to play. You might be a retailer. You might be a product designer. You might be a manufacturer. You might be considering becoming one of those things. You might be part of a city council. You might have access to your city council, which all of us do. You might just be a consumer, but we all have responsibility. One of the most common responses I get from people when I tell them about my zero waste endeavor is, yeah, I don't create a lot of waste. I recycle everything. Does that sound familiar? It's akin to telling people you're vegan and then people say, yeah, I don't really eat a lot of meat, dairy, and eggs. When the truth is you don't know how much you eat until you stop. And similarly, you don't know how much trash you create that you're purchasing. You're purchasing trash. We're purchasing trash until you stop. But more than that, We've all come to believe that recycling isn't trash, and of course it is. And this has been the most significant paradigm shift I have experienced since embarking on this endeavor. There's evidence that recycling, which is converting waste materials into new materials and objects, has been around since Plato. But as a way for municipalities to deal with the garbage crisis that occurred in the 1960s and 70s, recycling was a revolutionary concept. It changed the way the world looked at garbage. But as Paul Palmer would say, it wasn't the deepest response to garbage and garbage dumps or the most technically sophisticated. It was the first idea to be tried. And it focused on garbage as the problem to be solved instead of looking at the source of the problem. And we, the people, including those of us who called ourselves environmentalists, got sucked into believing that recycling is the solution to all of the waste we create. And I know I have been guilty of believing that. And I'm shocked at how much I have over-relied on recycling, putting everything into the recycling bin, assuming it would just get taken care of responsibly. And aren't I great for putting all of my stuff into the recycling container and not the trash? And even though I wouldn't have considered myself a minimalist, I certainly didn't consider myself a consumerist. And yet as long as a single use item, glass, paper, plastic, aluminum, had a recycling symbol on it, I had no compunction about buying it. And I certainly never thought about the things I've been purchasing all these years outside of food and beverage related items. I have not been thinking about how long a lifespan they had how, or would have. And, and could I use them for the duration of my lifetime? Could I use them for a hundred years, right? It just wasn't a lens through which I looked when making purchases. I just assumed if it had a recycling symbol on it, it was going to be recycled. Aside from the fact that I wasn't even taking into account the waste created in the product's manufacturing, and of course the transporting of that product to wherever it was going before I bought it, or the built-in obsolescence of the product, wasn't thinking about that. 
Or wasn't thinking about the fact that a huge majority of recyclable items don't get recycled, or the fact that most recyclable products can't be recycled perpetually, that even they can be remade into new products only so many times before inevitably going to a dump. They don't just disintegrate after being made so many times because we still keep throwing them away. We don't keep them and use them after one time or after so many times. They, they wind up in a dump at some point, either immediately or, you know, just after a delayed period of time. I was also not considering the fact that many products with the recycling symbol are actually downcycled, meaning that the materials are recycled into a lower grade of material that will be later thrown away, such as plastic bottles that are shredded to make plastic benches or other low quality plastic that will eventually wind up in a dump. Now, just a quick note about language. You know, this is something that means a lot to me. My thinking about the word landfill has also um, changed. Uh, Landfill feels like a euphemism to me that softens the power of the word dump. I couldn't yet find evidence of this, and I'm going to keep digging, but on the Zero Waste Institute's website, it asserts that the garbage industry encouraged the use of the word landfill in the 1970s and 1980s as an alternative to the harsher sounding word dump, which is what we're talking about here. Landfill just sounds so much more appealing. So I don't know if that's true. I would imagine it is true because the garbage industry doesn't want any negative associations with garbage. But even though you may hear me use the word landfill, I'm interspersing it with the word dump, and I may do away with landfill altogether over time. Words matter. There are so many problems with relying on recycling as certainly the primary means of waste management, and that's really where we're at. Um, And entire books have been written on the subject. I will recommend some on my website for today's episode. But the bottom line is Americans generate upwards of 250 million tons of trash, according to the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, making our per capita trash disposal rate 4.6 pounds per person per day. 65% comes from residences. It's pretty high. 35% comes from schools and hospitals and businesses. 55% gets buried in landfills, dumps. 33% gets recycled, which, again, we have to think about as also a dump because eventually everything that's recycled will wind up in a dump if we're not using it. And 12.5% goes to incinerators, which is a dump. It's just being burned and creating ash. And there are environmental issues around incineration. So 55% goes into dumps, 33% gets recycled, 12%, 12 12.5% gets incinerated. And then of course, mass production of plastics, which began just 60 years ago, has accelerated so rapidly that it has created, brace yourself, 8.3 billion metric tons 6.3 billion of which has become plastic waste. So let me just repeat that. We have this mass production uh, production of plastic, which has created 8.3 billion metric tons currently, 6.3 billion metric tons of which is plastic waste. Of that, only 9% has been recycled. The vast majority, 79%, is accumulating in dumps or sloughing off in the natural environment is litter, which means at some point, most of it ends up in the oceans, harming wildlife and habitats and ecosystems. I want to read a bit from an article to you about the history of garbage from Waste 360. Colonial America was as close to a zero-waste society as we've seen in this country. In the 1700s, manufactured goods were scarce. The little garbage we produced consisted of food waste or broken goods, or threadbare clothing and bedsheets that could no longer be repaired and reused. Food waste was usually fed to the family animals or thrown on the streets where wandering pigs or other animals ate it. Broken goods were buried in a backyard refuse pit. Technological advances in the manufacturing industry created our ability to make things more quickly and easily. As America industrialized and grew in population, our garbage changed to reflect the materials we made and the size of our population. Glass bottles and steel and paper products became more common. We weren't a zero-waste society anymore. Individually, we don't create much more garbage now than we did just a century ago. Today, according to the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency data, each of us creates 1,628 pounds of trash a year. 
Garbage historians estimate that a century ago, each city resident created somewhere between 1,000 and 1,500 pounds of trash a year, so pretty close. What has changed dramatically in the last 100 years is what's in our garbage. A century ago, ash, created by burning wood and coal for heat and for energy, was the biggest component of the waste stream. Today, ash has virtually disappeared from the waste stream, except at incinerators and wood-burning stoves. Paper and plastic now dominate the waste stream, which I'm sure surprises you if you think about paper, because we think paper just keeps getting recycled. But again, paper can be recycled only so many times before it too winds up in a dump. So let's just say I've made some changes in my own thinking, some changes in my own life, and perhaps they will inspire you to make changes in yours, or at least to just contemplate some of what I'm sharing. First and foremost, just like with making the vegan transition, it started with my being open to new information and looking at my part in the problem so that I could be part of the solution. The first thing I want to emphasize, is I think you've kind of gotten the idea, is that I look now at recycling as waste and as the absolute last resort. Now, no doubt you've heard a million times the reduce, reuse, recycle mantra, and the zero waste concept takes things beyond that. The zero waste mantra tends to be talked about as the five R's. In order is usually refuse, reduce, reuse, rot, and recycle. I think recycle is usually before rot, if there's an order to it at all. So I would add a few more R's to this list. So again, refuse, so not taking in new things. And there's a million ways to talk about that. So many ways that you don't even realize it. Today I was at the dry cleaners picking up some dry cleaning. We go to an eco-friendly dry cleaner, but you know, every time they gave us our clothes back, and this is just mostly for David, we're going to an event tomorrow night. He needed his suit and his uh, shirts pressed. Uh, they, they, They gave me the shirts and the jacket in plastic and I took it off and I said, no, you can keep this. And she said, oh, do you not want plastic? Uh, we can put that in our system and not ever put plastic on your clothes when you come to pick them up. I said, yes, please. That's awesome. So that's an example of just a small way to refuse something that you would normally take home. And reduce is the next one. So reducing consumption of non-renewables as much as possible. Reuse, rot, which is compost, and recycle. But of course, as we will continue to talk about, that really is the last resort. Now, the additional R's that I want to add first I want to add repair. Often repair is grouped in with reuse, but I think of it very differently. When I think of reuse, of course I'm reusing a shirt, right? I don't buy a shirt and then wear it once and throw it out. I'm reusing that shirt. However, when I think of reuse, I'm really thinking of using a glass bottle, a canvas bag, right? That's what I'm reusing over and over again. But I think it's necessary to call out repair separately because then I think about, oh, I have a shirt that got ripped. Maybe I can go get it fixed. I have shoes whose soles fell off. They're old. Instead of getting new shoes, maybe I can get those fixed, right? So I think repair, or I'm talking anything. I mean, there used to be repair shops. There used to be watchmakers, you know, repair shops. When I grew up, I knew our cobbler nearby. I knew, you know, we know we knew the uh, the seamstress. And we do have, like, our dry cleaner. They're our seamstress as well, and they're wonderful. I love going to our seamstress. I ain't going to learn how to sew. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to learn how to sew. So I'm going to go pay someone to sew a button on for me or, or, or fix a seam or something. So, so that's what we used to rely on. So I think it's worth calling out reuse, uh, reuse and repair separately. The other R that I want to add is relying on foods you can make from scratch. And the reason I like that is because, of course, you have reduce and refuse, both of which have negative rings to them. They're about kind of saying no to something. I like rely because I think it's proactive. Uh, It's not just about saying no. So relying on foods, you know, you can make from scratch. And we'll talk all about that. This isn't becoming a total homesteader. This doesn't mean you're going to, all your time is going to be taken up making everything from scratch. But I have to say, there is something to that. And it's also what's adding a lot more quality to my life. And we'll talk more about that as time goes on. The other R I would add is replace. And that I think is really helpful as you start thinking about implementing zero waste principles in your own life because there is a transition period. 
It's just like with becoming vegan. There is a whole transition period. And then when you get to the other side, this all becomes natural. This all becomes part of your habit. You know, we have a shoe free house. Took a while to get everybody on board with that, but it's just the way it is now. We have been carrying our canvas bags down to grocery stores and bringing them to our car for so many years that it is just a habit in our lives. But there are things that are new for us in this new journey. And and so there is a transition process. And so some of it isn't just about reducing what I'm bringing in. It, that's part of it. But it's also about looking for replacements for things I want or need so that they fit into my zero waste values. So, okay, refuse, uh, replace, refuse, reduce, reuse, repair, rot, recycle, and rely. No, you don't have to memorize that. But that's what I'm thinking about when I think about beyond re- reuse, um, reduce, and recycle. I also want to say that... When I started this journey, I did not start with a clean slate. We have plenty of waste in our house that we had to account for. Plastic bottles we had and have in the refrigerator holding mustard or ketchup. Wine bottles holding wine that can only be recycled and not really reused. A huge plastic bag of cat litter we had when I first started and I I'm very excited about the cat litter change that I'm making. That's exciting. (laughs) I get excited about these things. David makes fun of me because it is quite ridiculous how excited I get when I go to the bulk store. Uh, when I say bulk store, I don't mean big box stores. I mean, go to the bulk section of our, of our grocery store. Uh, I have dish soap and laundry soap in plastic bottles. So this is a journey and it will take a while to fully transition. But as I said in the beginning, it has been incredibly rewarding as well as exhilarating, i.e. a little exhausting. But that's why I'm sharing this with you so you can learn from me. The other thing I want uh, to do with that list is flip it, I guess not flip it completely, but I want to put rot all the way to the top. Rot meaning compost. And I'm going to say this, and you might not like it, but the food that comes into our house should never go out as waste other than, you know, a different kind of waste. But food that comes into our house should never go out to the garbage. Ever, never, ever, Ever. And I'm going to devote an entire episode to food waste and all the options we have for never sending food to the dump. The only reason dumps smell as disgusting as they do is because of the food that we're not putting in our bodies, but putting in the garbage. Of course, there are smells from excrement, mostly from diapers and from our companion animals that also contributes, and we will tackle that down the road. But You see my point. Food should never go in the garbage. And whether you have a garden or not, or a house or not, or a lot of space or not, there are many things we can do to turn that food waste into energy, okay? A renewable resource. Staying on the theme of recycling, now that I'm already reducing what I'm buying and I'm being more mindful about it in so many ways, including thinking about the workers who work in the recycling plant, never thought about them before you know, who sort my waste before I put the plastic and the glass and the aluminum cans, mostly um, the cat food cans, I rinse everything out. I'm embarrassed to say I wasn't doing this before. I'm embarrassed, okay? I'm admitting it. But now I am. So not only is it better for the workers who sort, it also increases the chance that my recycled waste actually gets recycled rather than just tossed in the dump because it's dirty. Apparently, the cleaner the containers are, the higher the value that's placed on them. So it's also not just a matter of whether they get recycled or not. It's also a matter of, you know, the the higher the value, the the cleaner the product, the higher the value. This is a multi-billion dollar business, the recycling business, the garbage business. So that's one thing I'm doing differently as well, uh, is cleaning out like my my cat's canned cans. Uh, But here's the exciting part that's related. When I first started on this journey, in the spirit of the replacement part of this process, I started frantically looking for bags, for garbage bags that I could use to replace the plastic bags I was using. I was looking for a compostable, right? I was looking for what what do other zero waste people do? And then it hit me. Now that A, I have fewer recyclables, and B, they're clean, there's no need for a plastic liner. We simply carry down the full container, right? We pull it out of the, we have a, we have a nice stainless steel shell and then there's the plastic, you know, big plastic bin for the garbage, you know, or whatever the bin inside. Just pull that bin out. We bring it down to the recycling bin in our garage and we empty it and then we bring the empty container back up and we can rinse it out when it gets mucky and we just rinse it out and then dry, dry it, right? 
so I don't have to get a replacement bag. So now I don't put white plastic bags uh, in our garbage can, even in our garbage can. So our recycling doesn't need the white plastic bag anymore because everything's clean. And the garbage can, which I am eventually planning on having be obsolete, we won't need a garbage can after a while. But the reason it can go into the garbage can as well, it being whatever the waste is, is because there's no food waste. So there's nothing wet. There's nothing gross. There's nothing smelly. So I don't have to put a liner in the car- the garbage can either. And we'll talk about what my garbage can consists of now that I'm being so much more mindful about everything, but that will be another episode. So now when, um, you know, when it's time to just gather any paper, you know, from the office that has to go into the, um, uh, recycling, you know, I just, I just can put it all in the bins and not have to worry. We in Oakland have a single stream recycling system, meaning that we don't have to separate it home. It gets sorted at the facility, like I said, but the other problem was, this is what's so funny. This is what's so funny. I was putting plastic. So I was putting all my recycling in plastic bags. Well, plastic bags are not allowed in a recycling bin. Like they can't, they can't, it, it messes with the machines in, in the recycling facility. So it's possible that every time I sent a bag, plastic bag of recyclables to the recycling center, right? When they pick it up in my gray bin, that it was just going to the landfill. It's possible. Right. They sorted the facility and it's likely that they also removed plastic bags or they removed plastic bags during the sorting process. But the point is those bags are plastic and they're going to wind up in the dump. So I don't need to use plastic liners for my garbage can. I don't know. I'm really excited about that. I don't know if you get excited about that. But that was revolutionary <laughs> to me. It was just revolutionary. Uh, so... One of the ways I've reduced what goes into our recycling bin, besides refusing and reducing my purchasing of even legitimately recyclable materials such as aluminum and glass, is recognizing the value of the glass bottles I already had, most of which were being used for the function for which they were made, i.e. they had salad dressing in them or whiskey or mayonnaise. So as I said, we still have these products in our home that we're going to phase out and not bring back in again. And aside from plastic ketchup bottles, of course, we had lots of glass bottles and jars in the fridge that in the past I would have just thrown into the recycling bin, i.e. the trash, the recycling trash, even though they were perfectly functional glass containers. So for those of you who say, yeah, duh, fine, bring it on. I deserve it. But I bought into the notion that if it's glass, it's 100% recyclable and it's just going to go back into use after being recycled. And now, of course, I see how ridiculous it is that we recycle perfectly good bottles and jars whose function is still 100% intact in order to crush them down and melt them down and make them into more glass bottles and jars. What? So granted, they're sometimes made into other things, but you see my point. We destroy perfectly functional bottles to make bottles. So now, having eaten up things like commercial olives and mayonnaise and glass jars and commercial salad dressings like Follow Your Heart and glass bottles and drunk up some scotch and beautiful glass bottles or rum in David's case, some of these bottles are clear. David's favorite rum is in this gorgeous green bottle. Now, instead of throwing them away in the recycling bin, I'm washing the labels and I'm left with these absolutely beautiful bottles and jars that I can theoretically use forever, 100 years, right? Lifespan, fine, whatever, forever. And I'm ashamed I hadn't done this before. Some labels have been easy to get off, some harder, but I've succeeded 100% of the time with perseverance. You simply soak your label ridden jar or bottle in warm soapy water for about an hour or longer, whatever works for you, you leave it overnight. At that point, after it's soaked for a while, you might be able to just scrape off what remains of the label and the glue and you're done. I'll use like a little steel wool for this, or you can use the flat side of like a butter or cheese knife. But if the glue is stubborn, use this formula. Mix one part oil, any kind, olive oil, coconut oil, vegetable oil, with one part baking soda, and you smear it on the gluey bits, let it smear on, and let it sit there for at least an hour or longer. Then you grab your steel wool, or even the abrasive side of a kitchen sponge, 
and you start wiping it off. The baking soda helps with the abrasiveness. The oil moistens it. So it comes off. I demonstrate this on a video on the page uh, on today's episode at joyfulvegan.com. It was an Instagram video that I've put on my website. I find that it works best not to run it, the bottle with the oil and the baking soda after it's soaked on for a while. I find that it's best not to run it under water immediately because the water might react with the oil and just make it less willing to come off. But with a little scrubbing and then a little soap and water and a little more scrubbing, I have so many beautiful glass bottles and jars. Yeah, life changing. The other small thing I did was I downgraded the size of my recycling bin. Now, before our city's recycling bin was 64 gallons. And yeah, like I would fill that up with cans and bottles and, you know, again, in plastic bags. I'm not doing that anymore. So now, I've downgraded it to 32, was it 64? I think it was 30, 64, and now it's 32. And I'm going to see how this goes, but I can even downgrade it to 20 gallons. The thing that's annoying, a little more than annoying, is that the contract the city has with California Waste Solutions, which handles the recycling end of things, is that our recycling fee is a flat fee. So that means that even though I reduced the size of our bin, the cost is still the same. But psychologically, I think it's a help. It's like uh, getting a small plate at a buffet. It means you're less inclined to pick um, a ton of food options. You'll you'll choose fewer food options if you um, than if you had a large plate. It's the same thing with the bin sizes. Now, I don't feel I need more incentive than I already have, but still, I'm glad to have done it. And it's kind of cute. It's a cute little bin, nicer than this massive recycling bin that we had before. Something I did notice right away, adhering to the refuse and reduce principles, was that as soon as um, as soon as the first week in this journey, I only had to put the garbage bin out once in a period of a month. Even my friend across the street noticed. And in fact, now that I think about it, a few times now, we didn't put the recycling out each week. We were able to skip a week. Now, that's not to say that I'm not going to be contributing to dumps. I will be. We have plenty of packaging in the house. But you know, until we use it all up uh, and never replace it, you know, we're still going to deal with that. But I've already noticed a reduction in how much garbage we've accumulated. And when I say garbage, I also mean recycling. I had already downsided the size of our garbage bin about a year ago and, and, and over relied on recycling, as you can see. And unfortunately, I can't do away with the garbage bin altogether. The city of Oakland mandates that residents pay for a garbage can. And I get it. Like, you know, they don't want to encourage people to not get a garbage service and then leave garbage all around the streets or in cities, you know, city bins, refuse bins, um, et cetera. Uh, but unfortunately, that means I can't, you know, I'm not, eventually I don't want to use the garbage can and I'm still going to have to pay for it. So... And I can't choose a smaller bin either. I have a 20-gallon conta container now, and you can't go smaller than that. I may talk to my city council member about this. It's worth just a chat because I think there should be incentives for people to reduce the amount of garbage and increase the amount of compost materials, green waste. But I also know that the issue of garbage is incredibly political as the garbage industry is incredibly powerful and lines the pockets of local officials more than you could imagine. That will also be a topic for another day, but let's just say I'm learning more about waste management than I ever thought I'd want to. And it's fascinating. And I think it's our responsibility to know that. Even though we can talk about what the manufacturer's responsibility is and should be, and even though we can talk about what the municipalities uh, should do, our cities once I bring any goods into my house or once I buy any goods at all, any kind of good, any kind of good, a food good, a packaged good, anything, they're now my responsibility. If I buy an orange from a store and I eat that orange while I'm sitting on a park bench or walking down the street or in my house, that orange peel is now my responsibility. And I think if we all started looking at it that way, we'd make quite different choices every single moment, every day. I've been encouraged and excited by the changes we've made, as you can hear, some of which I never imagined doing. And I'm going to talk in detail about different components in individual episodes and the reason the changes I'm making have an impact on animals. And you can read more details and see specific recommendations for now on my blog at joyfulvegan.com. But in short, here are some things that have been the biggest lessons, the biggest changes and discoveries so far. I can't believe how many paper towels I used to use. And how many single-use tissues to blow my nose? I didn't realize 
Again, you can chastise me. I didn't realize that used paper towels and used tissues weren't recyclable. I had been putting them in the recycled bin for years, but they're compostable. You can put them in the city, our city's green bin. I was also putting toilet paper cardboard rolls in the recycling rather than in the compost, the green waste bin. Duh, I didn't know. Again, chastise me. It's fine. Even though used paper towels can be put in our city's green waste bin, we've stopped using single waste, single use uh, paper towels, single waste, just single waste, single use paper towels. And now we use sponges and towels and rags for everything. Even though single use tissues can also be put in our city's green bin, I have switched from paper tissues to handkerchiefs. I know it's radical. I know it. See my blog. See my blog. Although I have to say it was pretty cute because we had some, I had, we had a board meeting here for the East Bay Animal Pack and my friend needed to blow her nose. So I gave her one of our handkerchiefs. And when she was about to go blow her nose, she's like, I don't want to use your handkerchief. Like, I feel bad. It's your handkerchief. I mean, she wasn't worried because it was dirty. It was, it was clean. I have them in little boxes. I said, no, 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 just use it and then put it in our, you know, our hamper. My f- other friend, board member, said, why well, don't just give her a tissue? And I said, because oh, tissue was zero waste. And he says, you just put it in the green bin. And I was like, yeah. Okay, so maybe for the times where a friend really needs tissues, <laughs> and there are going to be times that I might need it if we're really sick um, and the handkerchiefs aren't cutting it. We still have some tissue boxes left over. And because at least they can go in the green waste, it's better, uh, it is, than putting them in recycling uh, because that really is true waste to me. Uh, I might make a concession there, but uh, but I am only using the handkerchiefs and I love it. It's reduced my use of single-use tissues and paper towels immensely. Not only does our city have a robust compost system, we have our own compost bins. We've been putting our food waste in for years. We had these compost bins in our old house. But I've been doing it a lot more since we became zero waste. Like we we now are just really back into the whole system, uh, back into the whole process. We kind of got a little lax um, with it. So I can't wait to tell you all about composting. I only periodically bought things in thrift stores or secondhand. I wasn't like a big, I'm like a big vintage person, but I'm doing it now more than ever. I do go, there's a big flea market every month uh, here in Alameda and I do love going. I've gotten some great things there that I needed, but I'm doing it more now. I also buy things on Craigslist. I always have. I mean, I always have bought on Craigslist, but not as a rule. I just bought two rain tanks that our very good friends brought down from us from Santa Rosa. They were up in Santa Rosa. And my friend has since, sh- another friend has since shown me that ver- those very rain tanks, those very the, uh, rain barrels that f- were for sale at Home Depot for 70, no, for $95 each. And I got both of them for $75. So, so that's, you know, these are cost savings here as well. So what we needed them for was to kind of perfect our uh, gray water irrigation system. So I'm looking forward to that. We already have the tanks that hold a thousand gallons of rainwater um, and that they're full right now and can be used to irrigate our gardens. I also bought a used Le Creuset Dutch oven and I just bought a used soy milk maker from eBay. The point is in the past, I would have just gone it's easier and just buy it from Amazon or something. And now I'm thinking, okay, where can I get that that's secondhand? And that's also high quality, like a Le Creuset they have a lifetime guarantee for their products, and that's part of what this whole idea is too. They have a lifetime guarantee, meaning, like the zero waste principle says, they're manufacturing something that has a 100-year lifespan, right? Technically forever, if you want to look at it like that. So I bought a Le Creuset. Instead of getting a Le Creuset from, you know, from you know, a brand new one, I got a, a gently used one, and it's great, a, a Dutch oven. As I said, I'm not buying any single-use plastic at all, and I'm going to be sharing with you changes we're making in our bathrooms, including our toothbrushes, our toiletries, our shampoo, conditioner, lots to say there. Uh, already, I was already making my own plant milks, but now I'm doing it as a rule, and I was kind of, but I'm you know now just being more consistent. I make almond milk very easily, but almonds are expensive. I can make oatmeal in a pinch when I really need oatmeal, but it doesn't st- oat milk, but it doesn't store well. So I just bought that soy milk maker I mentioned, and I'm really excited to make soy milk, which I love soy milk. And I just stopped buying it commercially because I was just buying almond milk. But I do really love soy milk. And I'm also excited to get some nagari and to start making some tofu. I'm not, again, I, there's, there are plenty of places where I can buy bulk tofu around here. And there's one 
that I discovered that I love. It's as super firm as the wildwood tofu that I always rave about. So I'm not going to never, you know, I'm not going to only make my own tofu. I can buy it, but it's nice that I'm, I'm excited to make tofu because I've never made it. I've switched toilet paper brands. More about that in another episode. In terms of grocery shopping, uh, I was already taking tote bags to the store every time I went shopping. Every time I went to the farmer's market. I have We have so many tote bags. It's actually rid- ridiculous. I decided I'm now going to continue. Well, I'm going to continue taking my tote bags with me, but I'm going to bring extras. So when I see people who might need a bag, I'm going to give them a tote bag because we don't need as many tote bags as we have. I literally would be the person who like I would carry things out in my arm and shove them into my pockets and purses because if I didn't have a tote bag with me, I didn't want to get a plastic bag. Anyway, so I'm, I'm that was already consistent. But now when I'd go to the farmer's market, I'd still get plastic bags. Like we haven't bought plastic single-use bags for storing vegetables in, I don't know, like ever. I, I don't know the last time we bought a bag of Ziploc bags. But when I go to the farmer's market, I used to just still take a, you know, t- um, a plastic bag. Not all the time, but sometimes. But now I have these wonderful cotton and mesh bags. I have these beautiful... Uh, muslin bags that I take with me and they're great for flour. I can put flour in them. Um, but I have more of the meshy kind of bags that are great for produce. So now as a rule, I don't use any, uh, plastic bags at all. And so that's really fun. And you know what else? It's pretty awesome. There's just this, this feeling of just delayed gratification because for instance, when I go to the farmer's market near me, they don't have there's the, there's no stand that has nuts in bulk. The the nuts that I would have bought in the past from a farmer stand are in plastic, right? Plastic bags. But this one nut stand has walnuts in their whole sh- in the shell, and I love walnuts in their shell. So that's something I've been doing now instead of getting any of the plastic bags from the farmers market. But look, I get my nuts from grocery stores near me that have bulk bins that have nuts. So there's a delayed gratification aspect to it. So, oh, look, there's almonds. Oh, no, no, they're in plastic. Okay, I'll just get them another day from another place, right? So I like that too, is that it's just about kind of switching and delayed gratification. And I talk about this around the blueberries. You can read about how my breakfast has changed because of frozen blueberries. Read all about that at the Joyful Vegan blog. Something else that happened is I moved to a different neighborhood and I stopped going to a couple of the grocery stores that were near me in my other neighborhood. And what that meant was I stopped going to this one that I completely forgot about. Because like I said, I really do walk everywhere. So I like being able to walk down. So I would walk down to Trader Joe's and that's where I was doing a lot of my shopping. I'm going to tell you, I haven't been to Trader Joe's since this whole thing started. There's nothing at Trader Joe's that isn't packaged. I mean, so many of the, I mean, maybe there's some bananas I can get there and I have gotten like, you know, organic bananas and there's some apples and stuff. But I mean, I mostly get that stuff at the farmer's market. Well, not the bananas, but the apples. So, so I was using that. So like, I liked being able to walk. We also have a cute little produce place that I can also walk to. And I've been doing that more. So I've just been getting some things, you know, during the week I needed something that I didn't get at the farmer's market. I can get it at this little produce place. And I like that. But I forgot completely, so completely, because of course Whole Foods has all of these bulk bins, right? Farmer Joe's, also a grocery store we used to go to, we we, that was in our old neighborhood, don't go there anymore, it's not walkable, they have bulk bins, there's plenty of places with bulk bins, even the little grocery store, the little uh, produce store I, I mentioned, they have bulk bins, but I completely forgot about the food mill, which is a store that's been there, I don't even know, 100 years or something, they used to sponsor my cooking classes, and they are known for their bulk section. It's so incredible. So I've been going back there again, and it's been such a delight. And the people I knew like 10 years ago are still working there. It's just a delightful place. Clean. The bulk bins are amazing. I get bulk baking soda, bulk baking powder, bulk vital wheat gluten, bulk hibiscus flowers for for infused water, uh, tea, Uh and of course, everything else you'd imagine, but every spice, everything that would go into your pantry, everything, name it, every grain, every bean, every legume, every uh, flat kind of flour, every kind of flour. Um, there's obviously candy as well, uh, teas, there's coffee. They also have some things in liquid, bulk, bulk in liquid, liquid in bulk. So, uh, so for instance, maple syrup and olive oil 
They have honey too, but I've, of course I don't buy that. So I am now able to at least nearby me get even olive oil and maple syrup in bulk. Now, Rainbow Grocery in San Francisco is a place that I'm probably going to make a trip to once a month, maybe if that, because they have bulk tamari, which is my favorite kind of soy sauce. They have bulk miso, miso paste. Hello. Because that was one thing I was looking in my fridge recently and we still have miso paste in a plastic container. And I was like, oh my God, what am I going to do about miso paste? Because I love my miso paste. Um, Rainbow Grocery has it in bulk. Hi, I'll just go there and, you know, just make a trip of it. There was something else they had. They have a, they have a lot of other things too. So the point is... It, it reminded me to, to, this whole journey has returned me to places that I used to go and I loved and I want to support. And I encourage you to do that too. People have asked me like, oh, you know, where do I go around here? You may be surprised that what's near you that you haven't looked for before. It's just like when you become vegan. Before you become vegan, people are like, what do you do about this or that? And I'm like, once you become vegan, you look at everything through a different lens. You're not looking for that stuff now, so you don't know it exists. But once you become vegan... You go, oh my God, I had no idea that existed, right? It's the same thing. I'm experiencing the same thing. Like, oh my God, I completely forgot that that is around here. And this is kind of fun. I know, again, you're going to be like, yeah, whatever. That is so stupid. Um, I had, I've had a, I have a lot of teapots and they're not going anywhere. They're, they're, they're teapots I've had for decades. One of them is a Laura Ashley teapot I've had since I was a teenager. And recently I dropped the lid and it broke. And I was really sad, but I didn't get rid of the teapot. I started using a different teapot's lid for the teapot. I use the other teapot too. And I just, and I just change up my teapots all the time just to have a different experience. And I kept the lid that was broken because it broke into cl- three clean pieces. So I kept the lid and I thought, oh, I'll repair it someday. And, you know, how often does that happen, right? And then I also had this casserole dish that had two handles, a handle on either side of it, on either end of it. And that those two handles broke over time. And I put those in my quote unquote drunk drawer, which I've since cleaned out. And the other day I had epoxy and I decided to epoxy my teapot lid and epoxy the handles back on this, uh, this uh, casserole dish. So th- this goes back to the point of repair. And I'm, I'm really happy because now I have my teapot lid back again. And, and I, I, that's just kind of special. So those are just a few of the things we've changed. And of course, I have so much more work to do. We've got lots of wine bottles that really can't be refilled and reused much. So of course, I've kept some for oil and vinegar, those that can be reused, but I won't be able to use all the wine we have, all the bottles. I'm going to have to recycle them. I have started looking at uh, wineries and breweries in our city and nearby that allow you to um, to basically refill growlers. Growlers are just big bottles. And uh, and you can do that with w- wine and beer around here. We've already been doing this with a winery in Oakland called Urban Legend. Uh, the, it's, the, the, it's only the one blend. It's their Jack London blend. It's a red blend. And of course, you need to plan in advance because wine isn't meant to store in this um, growler the way corked bottles are the way it's meant to store in a corked bottle. Uh, One of David's favorite breweries called Faction. It's in Emeryville. Uh, I mean, uh, it's in Alameda and they allow you to fill up and refill the growlers. So we'll see how far we go with that. We'll see what happens in terms of, you know, eventually if we get rid of our wine, we'll probably always have a couple for special occasions. Like, but I don't know. I mean, I've made other changes that I couldn't imagine making the only thing I've bought in glass since I started besides wine I think we have bought wine and and uh and uh spirits we 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 do buy spirits in glass as well and I've been washing those bottles are gorgeous is the garlic aioli um that I've been raving about for some 15 years because it's out of this world David said I should just try making my own aioli my own mayonnaise and of course I can and I will but I think once I see how much fat goes into making mayonnaise I'm probably never going to eat it again so I just want to keep my blissful ignorance for now and the jars are easy to wash and the labels are easy to remove so I've rewashed and kept those jars and they've come in handy for shopping and storing things. Uh, So like I said, I've been able to find the other liquids in uh, uh, bulk. So I'll be using those bottles and jars for that. But I will save that for another day. Um, I am not switching my cat's food right now. They eat only canned food, which is at least 100% recyclable because it is aluminum. So at least in that sense, it really is uh, reused. You know, scrap metal is a big industry. But I may revisit this as well. Uh, the most beautiful aspect of this journey has just been how much I've learned and how open I've been to things that I 
th thought I wouldn't do. Um, but aside from doing my part to reduce my footprint on this earth and David as well, what's really beautiful is that we feel like we're living more in alignment with what we value. David and I have always valued simplicity. We considered ourselves living pretty low on the, on the, you know, consumerism scale. David would tell you that one of the aspects of first vegetarianism and then veganism that appealed to him uh, was the was how it aligned with simple living that he admired in Thoreau. There was a time he was reading a lot of Emerson and Thoreau when we first met. So we saw ourselves living simply and certainly relishing experiences over things. We don't accumulate a lot of stuff, and yet we were fully immersed in the consumer culture, even if less so than than most. So since we started this journey, things just feel more simple and more beautiful, even more slowed down, which is absolutely lovely. We've been paring down what we buy. We've been going through our cupboards and closets and downsizing. We're giving away or we're selling what we don't need, donating. It's going to be a long time before it's complete, but already things are starting to feel cleaner and less cluttered and prettier. As I said, glass is so much prettier than plastic. And I love seeing my pantry and refrigerator and freezer fill up with all these glass beauties. It's lovely to use organic cotton towels to wrap my vegetables in and, and put them in the crisper drawer in the refrigerator. They stay fresher so much longer than ever when I was using plastic bags for, for vegetables. And they're so much cleaner looking. Everything just feels clean and it feels really good. This is a journey and I'm glad to be on it. I'm glad to be on it with you. And like I say, don't do nothing because you can't do everything, do something, anything. And there's so much we can do for the animals. This is Colleen Patrick Goudreau. Thank you for listening.